like he keeps out front with people. And a lot of people had a hard time seeing him or looking at him. And that's another line that the Beatles said, uh, he's got to be good looking because he's so hard to see because so many people couldn't even look at him. But we, after that, we started seeing where we were in this position because we knew that we were part of this, of the revel revelations in the Bible. We knew that we had part in it. And so we read and it talked about a hole in the desert or going to the, the, the kingdom. And we found out, we started looking into the Death Valley, what's underneath Death Valley, and we found out there was the Armagosa River and blind fish and all kinds of things that just made us believe that there was a whole world underneath and that some of Montezuma's people are already under there waiting for us. And then what would happen is that about <clears throat> a couple thousand of the of the chosen pe white people would go down into San Andreas and stay there for about 50 years. And then there was Athens, or I can't remember all the names, but something was going to happen. And then we were going to come back up. And this was when the, the earth would be all black. Well, first thing is, wouldn't you be pretty old by that time? And second thing is, why was the earth going to be all black? No, we wouldn't. We wouldn't be old because we wouldn't age. Because to go into the hole, you would have to be perfect in your mind and in your body. And so, it would be black, just meaning that there would be no more white people up on the earth. They would all be wiped out completely. And um. Let's see. I was going to say something else, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, well, yeah. And the Beatles sang that. After the Revolution song, they say, um, now the moon begins to shine. You know, good night, sleep tight. It was, it's almost like a lullaby for everyone, for all the white people having their karma to be completed. Well, what do you mean by the word karma? I think you used it twice. It's used in India, and it's just so, it's like, as you sow, so shall you reap. Like, what you put out, you get back. Like, we, we being the white men, have put out a lot of pressures on other groups, like the Indians when we first came over, and the slavery on the black man, and we're going to get it back, and the time has come to get it back, because the cities and everything is moving at such a high speed that it's going to break. That's what I mean by the karma. Now, uh, how are you supposed to get down to the center of the earth? Well, we hadn't quite figured it out yet. We were looking for the hole. That's what we were doing in the desert with the dune buggy. And that's why we needed more dune buggies. We, were, we had a good idea that it was in the Death Valley area, but we weren't sure just where. And, um, we weren't quite we weren't quite sure of how it was going to work. We were going to get in there, but maybe it was going to be rigged up from someone who's gone down before. That it would have water on the top, and then the water would like move away, go away somehow by some kind of mechanism. And then if we played around the hole enough that went down there, we'd find it out. And then we could just walk down it, and then we'd have to float down a river one of the rivers, and then it would take us down, it would take about, I think, about two weeks we figured out to get down to the center. And then once we got to the center, it would be tiny and everything would be great big magnified. Like the pearls, and it talks about the pearls, or the giant pearls, and we'd be just a little tiny, about maybe five inches compared to everything else. So it talks about the pearls. Who talks about the pearls? At the end of Revelation. The very last book, almost to the last page, it says that the kingdom will have giant pearls. I don't know who said it. I don't know who wrote it, but it talks about that in gold everywhere. Now you said that you all used to sit around uh, Gresham and the desert and talk about this philosophy of going down to the center of the earth. Could you name some of the people that were used to talk about it? Gypsy and Brenda and myself and Katie and Charles. And Dick 
and Clue and Snake and Rachel. Those little ones they usually talk about the most, Sadie did sometimes. But I don't know if she actually believed it or not. But all the rest of us, we, we really believe it. Now, to, to go out to the desert in Death Valley and find this uh, hole that's going to lead you to the center of the earth, you needed dune buggies, is that right? Uh-huh. Now, where were you going to get the dune buggy? Well, we bought in the forest, and then they got taken away. So we started just taking them. Now, I remember one of our conversations, we were talking about the uh, Hinman murder. There was something that you said about the, about Hinman and dune buggies. Could you tell me what that was? Um, we had, I, I, just from talk, I didn't know too much about what was going on. But from talk, he was wealthy. And with the money he gave us, we were going to get dune buggies. But he never gave us any money. Okay, now is that uh, all that you can think of or all that you remember about this philosophy of uh, going to the center of the earth? Uh, I think so, right at the time. Now, you said something about thinking that uh, Charlie is uh, or was Jesus. Do you still believe that? And if you do, was there anything that he ever said or did that made you believe it? Yeah, I still believe he is. And, you know, I can't say it in words, only that he's almost not even human. I mean, you know, he's got his body and all, but... He's, he's gentle. I mean, he's everything. He's everything at once. It's, it's hard, you know, I can't even almost explain him, you know? And, like, I, it's like he has no ego, meaning, you know, you know what ego is? It's faces that we put on for each other. And he has none of that. He's just a person. And... Oh, it's so hard to explain why I believe he is, but I know he is. Oh, uh, will you ever uh, say anything about being Jesus except for what you just told me? He used to, he used to say, um, I see too much, I see what's happening, and I don't want it. I don't want to be in this position. He'd say, I wish someone else would. He'd say, I, I'm, I know that I, I died on the cross before. He told us about a, a suicide and that sort of like acid trip he had one time. This was when he first got out after his seven years. And he um, he said that all of a sudden he was being, he was carrying the cross again and he was being nailed on it. And Mary, the first girl that was ever with him, was crying at his feet. And he said he felt it all over again and he knew, you know, that he had died. See? And if you could, if you could give up your personality and your ego, and be willing to die, then you were already dead. The, the body didn't mean anything. Now you say Mary. Are you talking about the Mary Brenner, the girl that was with him? Yes. So when you say that he had the the, uh, the dream or the, whatever it was after an acid trip, that he was again nailed to the cross. The Mary that was with him is the Mary that. Uh, we all know now it's Mary Brenner, is that right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so one time I had an acid trip like that. He said that he said that he died and everybody wrote about it. And that they're, they're using him but as they do, you know, Jesus so holy and so great because they didn't, they didn't go when he went. But he said all his true followers went with him. In other words, they said if you... If, if you crucified him, you're going to crucify us too. And so I was in Hollywood one time, and I had it as a trip, and I, and I was up on the cross. It sounds far out, but I was, for real. I was feeling him do it. And I could feel the knife or the sword when it went in too. I know that he is. You know, I believe that he's Christ. I never would deny it. Now, uh, as you know, uh, Charles Manson, along with yourself and a lot of others, are in uh, great jeopardy in this trial. And there's a, a, a many indications that if Manson is convicted of his first-degree murders, that he may 
die in a gas chamber. Have you ever had any thoughts about that perhaps this would be uh, like a second crucifixion? Yeah, many times. Well, it seems strange that it would happen again, seeing as he already died once. But if it did, it would be all right. Because what we did was part of a, uh, was part of the plan that we have no control of. Now that you've mentioned the plan that we have no control of, tell me what you mean. Well, it, it seemed like after we knew what was going to come down, we tried talking to leaders, you know, black leaders, and we saw that they were stalling. And, and it was almost as though we had to make the first move for it to continue to develop to get bigger so that it would happen because the black man loves us so much that he would be our slave and do everything we said, let us beat him and mistreat him for so many years that he he almost doesn't want to do what he has to do, but he sees that he has to do it. And so it was up to us to start it. Now you, you say that uh, you talk to some black leaders. Uh, uh, who were these black leaders? And you say it was up to us to start it. Now, what do you mean by starting it? Um, I don't know. All I know is his name is John. And he, he's pretty big in um, government. I don't know. He may not be, you know, but we thought he was. And starting starting it was that to just start killing people because it's going to be blood for blood. And then did you believe that the, that the black people would have to start killing the white people? No, it wouldn't be that way. White man would kill white man. The black man would sort of be there too, helping along. Because it's, it was, it's like white man is divided. We, you know, we aren't united in our thoughts. And the black man is more together. They're more one in their thoughts. You know, they've even, they've even in here, I've gotten a lot of talk how they call each other sister and each other brother. But very seldom do two white girls say, hey, sister, you know, or greet you when you come in, you know. They say, sister, come on in, you want a cigarette? You know, they don't do that. And so white men would kill white men for their beliefs. If they didn't believe the same, they're going to knock each other off. And then black men will be there just sort of helping, crawling in the night. Well, how are you going to start the uh, this revolution? By killing. By doing a murder that had no sense behind it, and by putting words that would make people scared. Because the more fearful the people get, the more frantic it will get, and the faster it will happen. Now I'm going to get. Uh, now we've learned the theory. I'm going to start talking about specific events. You tell us, starting, uh, what you know about the Hinman murder, then switch to what you know about the Tates, and then after that, to what you know about the La Biancas. Okay. I knew that three, three of us, do you want me to give you names? That Bobby and Mary and Sadie went to Gary Hinman to get some money and um, anything else he had and him. And if he was and if he wouldn't come, they were gonna kill him. And he didn't come. But they were there for a lot of days. And they would call up and they were real scared and everything. And Charles went over there one night to tell him to you know, relax. Because he could he could keep his cool, but I would, I would never call him villainous, even though all this has happened. And then he came back, and about the next day, I think, the rest came back, and they said that they had killed him. Who said that? Sadie. Sadie came in grinning, saying we killed him. And then I asked her what it was like, you know, and she just said that it was real weird, and he made funny noises. Uh, there's been some talk that at one time Charlie Manson had gone over there and cut off Hinman's ear. 
Would you comment on that if you know anything about it? And also, would you comment on anything that Sadie or Bobby Boussoulet said about the actual killing? Um, yeah, Charlie went over there. I heard from someone, I don't remember who, that Charlie had gone over there and cut off Gary's ear and that he had come back. That's when I said, and just a little bit before when Charlie went over there, that's what happened. And I guess that all I ever really heard about it was they had a hard time killing him because he wouldn't die. And that I don't even remember who actually did the killing or not. I never got that straight. But you told me once that uh, that uh, Sadie uh, was always around sharpening knives and that after Hinman had died, she could hardly wait till the next time. Could you elaborate on that? Well, Sadie was always more or less the rougher of us girls. You know, she was always up front. In fact, the Beatles had a song about her called Sexy Sadie. And that song just fit her so perfect, you know. And... After that, we were all almost fascinated by the thought of killing people just because we've been, you know, taught to stay away from it. And nobody knows about death, really, you know. And when she came back, she was almost infatuated by it. She kept sharpening the knives, getting them real sharp. And she was always wanting to go creepy crawl and, you know, get credit cards or do this and that. She always wanted to be in on the murders. She liked to be in on the rough stuff that Charlie would have us do. Okay, now tell us about uh, about the Tates and then go to the lobby office. Well, I don't I don't really remember how I learned exactly that the Tates had been done. I can't remember knowing before they left that they were going to go do that. I know that Charlie came into Katie and I. We were sitting in taking care of the baby. And uh, this was that night. And he said something about, Can, do you see why I believe that we have to kill? And we both said, yes. You know, we see. He said, do you want to do it? And we said, we said, no, but we know it has to be done, so yes. You know, in other words, we didn't want to go out and actually like do something in, but it had it had to be done, and we were the only ones that saw that it had to be done. So I went on to sleep, and Katie did too, and then Charlie came in and woke her up, and I didn't know why, but I sort of had an idea it was to go do some, you know, knock somebody off, and then the next morning. Sadie was watching the news, I think. Somehow I found out that they had done it. Oh, no. I asked Katie, and she told me. What did she say? She said that, that they had murdered five people, that they didn't know there were going to be that many at the house, and they didn't know who the people were, and there were a whole lot of them. And it happened so quick, and it was a horrible thing. You know, she was shaken up by it. And then, see, and then somehow we, re we heard the news and they said, oh, my God, they were rich, you know. They were famous people, you know. And then that's really all that was said about it. And then the next night, oh, but Sadie said she left her knife there. They said it was done real messy and it, it happened in about 20 minutes, you know. I didn't really get the details too good. And then the next night, um, well, I was feeling bad, to tell you the truth, because Katie was my best friend. And to think that she was strong enough in her believing, not, you know, to be able to go kill, I wanted to, too, because I wanted to be just like Katie. Katie or Sadie? Katie. That's Patty. I wanted to be just like her. And almost it was like it would make myself stronger to know that I could kill somebody, because at the moment I'm killing them, I have to be that willing to die. Well, was, was uh, Kate, this Patricia Kramer, was she out with, um, in the Kate murders? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, Tex and Sadie and Katie 
around the inside, and, I, and Linda was supposed to be on the outside. That's the way the story went. And then, so I was feeling kind of bad, because I didn't get to go. I was sure hoping that if we did it again, I could go. Now, why in the world would you want to go out and kill somebody? Because it had to be done. It had to be done just in order for the whole thing to be completed, for the whole world's karma to be completed. We had to do this. And I wanted to do it because I thought that if I could go out and kill someone, that I would, you know, it's not an easy thing to do it. And that in a sense, I would be giving up totally to what I believed in because I would have to pay the consequences if they were to come back. So if they were to come back, what do you mean by that? Well, I didn't, you know, like, even after it happened, I wasn't really scared about being arrested for it. You know, I wasn't ever hiding. We were in the desert hiding, but not, you know, it was almost like a game. To get ready for when it really came down, we'd know how to hide. You know, we weren't, like, doing a real good job of hiding out there like we could have been doing you say uh, they were going to come after me. Do you mean the people, or do you mean the, the people that were killed would come back, or what do you mean? No, the, the man would come and try to get me for doing what I did. What do you mean? Oh, the police. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> the uh, night after the uh, Kate killing, uh, what happened then? Well, we were all sitting in the kitchen, and Charlie pulled me out to the side, and he said, are you crazy? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, are you crazy? And you said, uh, yeah, no. What does crazy mean to you? In other words, it meant, are you almost, to the regular person's thinking mind, are you crazy enough to believe the way I believe, to see the way I see, that, that we are, you know, that we have been sent down to start this in motion? And I said, yes, because I, I do. I'm crazy enough to believe it. And he said, are you crazy enough to be able to go out and kill someone for this? And I said, uh, yeah, so I was. So he said, OK, go get two changes of clothes and get in the car. So I did. You want me to continue? So there was. Linda, and Charlie, and Tex, and me, and Katie, and Sadie, and Clem. We all went out that night. And we went driving around. We were driving. Uh, did everybody have a change of clothes? What kind of a car was it? Were there any weapons in the car? Yeah, everybody had two changes of clothes. And I think we only had two weapons that I knew of in the car. Those were big knives. And they were underneath the floor mat. One of them was, anyway, that I was sitting on in the back seat. And it was Johnny Schwartz's car, an old, probably in the 50s, a Chevy or something like that. And so we drove and we drove and we drove. And they couldn't find any place. And I was tired. And most everybody was tired. So we went to sleep. And then when I woke up, I heard Charlie talking to Sadie. Or no, Tex. That's who he was talking to, Tex. And he said, everything's, I got everything okay. And uh, they think it's a robbery. And just, they're tied up. Just go on in. I got their wallet. They're sure it's a robbery. Just tell them everything's okay so that when they go, don't make it so that they got to be tortured. Make it quick and easy. You know, for them, because just as... Did he say anything about what had happened the night before, that something about Tex getting everybody all heated up? Um, I remember talking about it, but I can't really say for sure if I actually heard him saying it, but it was mentioned that he'd blown it, because then these people were afraid. And the idea was to do it...
house look freaky? Well, in order to create, it had to be look like an obvious, an obvious murder that there was no robbery, nothing behind it, just flat out to do it, to start this paranoia going, and so we had been told this was the best time to use our witchcraft. Who told you that? When was it told to you? And what is witchcraft? Um, well, Charles told it to us. And I can't remember just now. It might have been before we went in the house or before we even left. When you say Charles and all these conversations, you mean Charles Manson, is that correct? Mm hmm yes. So, oh, and what witchcraft was, or is, to the, the group, was just that women are more aware of the men, and that, because they know how to take care of the man. And so witchcraft is just all the little things a woman does. Like sewing would be a form of it. And so he said, this is when you can use your greatest amount of witchcraft, meaning you can use your imagination and do, you know, a whole number, meaning making it look ugly. But I couldn't get behind that, and I don't think any of the others could, and I really don't think that Charles could have. So um, I went back in the bedroom, and I saw the, the woman laying down, and Tex handed me the knife and, you know, said, okay, you know, get to it. Uh, was the woman dead at that time? And if you think she was dead, what made you think she was dead? She was dead. She was just laying there. Like the man was, like I say, he was gurgling. And she was just laying there. She didn't even make a moan or a groan. I didn't feel her, you know, her pulse or anything. And her head was covered, so I didn't see her face. I kind of wished I had it. Wow. Because I could have seen what I'd done more. You know, a face shows so much more that maybe it would have stirred something more up in me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, okay. I know it sounds horrible, but almost for my own punishment, maybe, to see the face after it was dead. And so then um, I was supposed to mess her up. And I took the knife, and I started stabbing, and I, and I turned into an animal almost. You know, I just completely let out on that woman's back. I must have done it about ten times. And then... Was the the, the uh, actual stabbing of the woman, did that, was that unusual to you? Did it feel different than you thought it might have felt? It felt so weird that I blew my mind behind it, if you understand what I mean by blow my mind. I mean, I lost control. I went completely nuts that moment. It was, do you want me to explain? It was hard to get through. It, like, when I thought of stabbing, I didn't, I, I didn't really have any idea in my mind, but... It's a real feeling. It's, it's not even like cutting a piece of meat. It's much tougher. And it was, I had to use both hands and all my pressure, all my strength behind it to get it in. And so once I started, the feeling was so weird that I just kept doing it. Like I said, I did it about 10 times, I think. And then, would you want me to continue? Then I went into the other room and I noticed that there had been things written. On the wall, there was pig and rice and helter-skelter. And I mean, that might be all. There might have been something else. Now, uh, what did those words mean to you, and what were they written in, and where were they written? Helter-skelter was written on the refrigerator, and that was used to let people know that the Beatles were the prophets, and they were telling it like it was, and that it's coming down fast, and you just be ready, you know, with, you know, get it on, do whatever you have to do for this whole thing to be over. And Pig was the white, the white businessman who um, hated his neighbor, couldn't look at his neighbor with love, who was going to get it in the end. And then Rise was for the black man, saying that it was his turn to, you know, be leader after all that time. And I don't remember where, I, Rise, I think, was written on the wall, 
I'm not sure where pig was written, but I know that they were written in blood. Who's blood? Mr. LaBianca's. Now, all these things that we've talked about, Helter Skelter and Pig and so on and so forth, they're all things that came out of this Beatle album we've been talking about. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who wrote it? The Beatles. Who wrote these verses in Mr. Laviano's blood? I think Katie did. Uh, tell us about what property, if any, was taken from the Laviancas, what property, if any, was left, and what you did after the killings. Um, we took some change, and then I was busy with the fingerprints because I didn't want any to be left, and the others... Now, what did you do with the fingerprints, and who told you to do something if someone did? Um, Katie handed me a towel. No, I said, what about the fingerprints? I left them on the lampshade, and Katie handed me a towel and said, go wipe them off with this. So I went and I just about did the whole bedroom all over and everything I had touched. And we did the kitchen and just sort of all over, just a whole fingerprint thing because we hadn't worn any gloves. And then Katie and Tex, when I came out of the ba bedroom, they were taking a shower. I don't know if Katie actually took one, but I know Tex did. And then after that, we were hungry, and so we went and we took some cheese and milk out of the refrigerator, and we, and we took it with us, and we left out the back door and went down the fence and down the sidewalk. Oh, and we changed our clothes inside the house from our black clothes into regular clothes. And Tex's a zipper broke, so I had to give him my pair of pants, and I took a pair of Mrs. LaBianca's shorts and put them on. Uh, tell us if Texas clothes or anybody's clothes have blood on it, and tell us what you did with the bloody clothes. Uh-uh. I didn't see blood on any of our clothes. We really didn't need to even change them other than they were all black and dark colors. And we took the clothes and we walked and we walked for a couple blocks, and then we uh, threw them in a trash can. And then we went and we hid in the bushes and waited for daylight to hitchhike home. Tell us about the ride home. First, first ride we got was from a black man, and he took us to the Griffith Park where the freeway starts. And then this man in this funky old blue and white car picked us up, and he drove us almost all. He drove us to Chatsworth Street. We even stopped and bought him breakfast at some place on Topanga Canyon Boulevard. I don't remember the name of it. I think it starts with an N. And then he dropped us off at Chatsworth Street, and we went um, around an orange grove, and then over the highway real quick, and then down in the creek, and we walked up, and then Katie went over to Devil's Canyon, and Tex walked up around the dump, and I came up through the Pony Corral. And then we all just went, you know, let's see, it was morning. We all just started doing whatever we were going to do. Oh, I went down to the farmhouse, and the, hitch and the man who had picked us up hitchhiking came driving around. He came, and, but I, I covered up my head and played like I was sleeping, so he never saw me. But he wondered if we were from Spawn's Ranch, and we told him no. <laughs> now, did anybody see you coming back to the uh, ranch? When I say anybody, I'm talking about girls at the ranch. See you coming back, and did anybody see you and everybody else leaving? Uh-huh. Kathy saw us leaving. Kathy Myers. And Spooker saw me coming back at the end of the phone. And other than that, no. Uh-uh. I just went, I mean, when I walked up from to the pony crowd, Lynn saw me. But other than that, everyone else thought I had just been sleeping all night. Now, when you left with Charlie in the car, was there anybody else who saw you leaving? And she knew, because she wanted to go. Well, how did you know Kathy wanted to go, and why didn't she go? Well, Kathy 
Kathy was more or less coming and going and coming and going. She said she was with us, but she was, you know, she'd leave every couple of weeks for a few days. In other words, her amount of loyalty to the family wasn't complete. So for her to do it would almost be like a risk, like she would freak out and then run away and who knows what she'd do. And she was feeling bad because she wanted to go, because she wanted to help out. <laughs> now, uh, after you got back, strike that. Were uh, were any was anybody else who went with you that night supposed to go into any other houses and commit any other murders? Uh huh. All the rest were going to. They were. I don't know where they were going to do. They were just going to do what we had done. Same thing. But it was going to be Linda and Clem and Sadie. You said that Clem was also in the, in the car, and he was about to uh, go out and do the same thing that Charles Watson had did, done. Is that correct? Yeah. And uh, had there been some conversation or anything between Charles or anybody as to what, what was going to happen that night before everybody went out, and especially was Clem present during any of these conversations? Yeah, we were all present. We all knew what we were going to do. We all talked about it. Well, tell us what you said and what other people said. Well, not, really not that much was said other than the fact that we were going to do it because it had to be done and that we were going to do it the next night and that this was just the beginning, you know. But this would be probably all we'd ever have to do. Now, uh, Kasabian, a Kasabian girl, was on the Tate murders, but she never went inside the house, at least to my knowledge. And uh, what, what exactly did she do in regard to the LaBianca murders concerning the car or anything like that? She drove it most of the time, but then she got too nervous. Because, you know, Charlie was directing and driving. They turn right, turn left, go straight, you know, turn around. So um, she got too nervous and she said, you know, well, then you drive the car. So he got out and then he drove it. Now, did uh, the Kasabian girl, she, her name is Linda, is that right? Did Linda Kasabian have a change of clothes with her that night, too? Well, whether all these, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not positive that every person did like they were asked to do. You know, in other words, I know that every single person there was asked to get two changes of clothes for their own for their own well-being. You know, but I can't remember actually seeing everybody's two changes. You know, like they were sort of like get it for yourself and keep track of it. So I, I pretty much remember everybody having it. Now, in uh, some articles I've read in the newspapers and in some transcripts that I've also read. Susan Atkins, who's also known to you as Sadie Glutz, says that uh, after they let uh, everybody off at the La Bianca house, that they went home to the, back to the ranch. But there's also been a story that they stopped at another house uh, to do the same thing that you did. Now, did you know anything about that, or did you hear anything about that? No, I hadn't, but I knew that was the idea. And so I said I said to Sadie the next day, I said, well, you know, what did you guys do? You know, what, what happened with you guys after you left us? And she said, nothing, we just came back. You know, I, don't, I didn't hear anything about that other. She said that they looked around for a while, but nothing came, nothing happened. Now, when we sat down here before I actually turned on the tape recorder, I asked you uh, if you know what the word remorse meant, and you said no, and I told you it meant that uh, feeling sorry. Could you tell us how you feel now about uh, what happened to the uh, La Biancas and all the other people that were killed? Well, I can't really feel sorry, because I did it. and. I did it with every intention of it being right. 
Sometimes when I think about it, see, I try not to think. That sounds pretty ridiculous, but I don't. I try not, I try to keep my mind clear. When I think about it, it makes me feel bad, you know. I, I can start to cry, especially because the kids, because they're my age. I didn't really have them. You say you feel badly. What makes you feel badly? When, when I start thinking about the kids having to find the folks, the parents, I, you know, that seems ugly to me. The La yeah, the La Bianca. And I heard that Mr. Tate sort of blew his mind. He put on a yippie hairdo looking for the people that did it to his daughter. I feel sorry for those people. How about the people that are dead? Don't you feel sorry for them? I, 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 uh, to be honest, no. Why don't you feel sorry for the dead people? Well, all it is is a body. You know, I mean, that's the way I feel about my life. In other words, when I went out and I did them in, it's like I'm not willing to have myself killed. I only, I don't, I only see that all this around me is just a body and just part of what I come from. And where I come from is much greater. In other words, I believe that you come. I believe that you come from nothing, and you're going to go back to nothing. And while you're here, you almost are nothing. You're just an animal. When you went out to, to uh, and were part of the uh, group that killed the Labiancas, did you think that what you were doing was right? And if you did, why was it right? I thought it was perfectly right, and I thought it was perfectly right because I see, I, and I, even today I still see the way I did then. I see it coming up to the, um, the vibration of everything is coming up. It's like a big tune coming up. It's going, down, and it's going to get up to the highest point, and then it's going to break. And this paranoia had to be started to get the vibration going even stronger. And it's just part of the plan. And I have no control over it. So then do you think the things that you and Charlie and Sadie and the rest did are kind of preordained? Uh-huh. And I think what happens here is probably going to be preordained, too. When you say what happens here, you mean do you think that the results of the trial are preordained no matter what anybody does? Is that right? Yeah. In other words, I think that everything that happens is perfect. It's, I know it sounds probably real far out, but it's, it's, tr it's true. Sometimes I doubt it, and then I get nervous and shaky and everything, but most of the time I'm pretty sure that everything that happens is perfect. What do you think is going to happen at the trial? I have no idea. I know that I thought a lot about the worst. Not that I think it's going to happen, because I wasn't wrong. But I've been trying to, in case it would happen, I've been trying to prepare myself for such a thing. Did you really care if you're... Uh if uh, you're given the death penalty in this case and die, do you really give a darn whether you get life in prison or something less than that? Is it, uh, do, you, do you really want to die? I don't, I don't want to, and I don't not want to. In other words, I'd love to get out of this. You know, I'd love to go back on the street and just mingle with people. Because, see, I love, I love everything just as much as everybody else, but I just happen to see what's going to... I just happen to see what's going to be happening. <laughs> Leslie, if uh, you could turn the clock back and uh, go back that night that you asked Charlie to go along with him to 
kill the Lambayakas, although you didn't know who was going to be killed. Dear, would you do it again? Yes, I would. I can't, I can't feel sorry for what I've done. And like I, like I say, I have, I have no control. And like I'm not trying to, you know, do like Sadie's doing and put it on Charlie, because I don't think Charlie has any control. In other words, what he talks. He talks with words that, like, come from another place. He doesn't, like, even talk with words that regular people use. And, and he, used to, he used to even say, um, I've become an empty hole. He'd say, I can, he says, I have no control of what I'm saying. He says, I have no control of my actions. I don't even think about what I'm doing or saying. And, and it was like that for a lot of us, especially those of us who almost gave up more to the family. In other words, gave up more of our own want for the, for the whole group. So, in other words, if the clock could be put back, if I saw that this was the way it was coming down again, I'd do it again. <laughs> You'd do it again, even if you thought you were going to get caught and be in the same position you are now. Yeah. Like, you know, I hope I can, I hope I can walk, you know, out, or that I can, in other words, I want to be free, but I'm not afraid to die. But you're a religious girl, I know we've talked about that. Do you think that maybe you're kind of like a... Oh, one of God's messengers carrying out his will or something like that? You're going to really think I'm nuts, but yeah. I do. I think I'm an angel. And so to speak, not with wings, you know, naturally I know I don't have wings. But I mean, in other words, I believe I'm one of the disciples. I'm one of the people spoken about in the Bible. Maybe not mentioned, you know, like names. But I know I'm in other words, what I feel is so real. I can't, I can't talk the reality of it, but I feel it. It's a fulfillment inside me. Is, is there anybody else in the group that you think might be an angel too? Or, yeah, well, it's all up to the person. I mean, if they believe it, then they are like Brenda does. I'm pretty sure Brenda knows she's She's one, and the Gypsy would know she's one, and Katie would, and um, Diane and Rachel probably would. Well, if Charlie's Jesus, and you girls are angels, and you're uh, doing God's will, and God's will is that the revolution starts so that the colored people can take over the earth, uh, why do you think that everybody's in jail? I don't know. You know, it would almost be for the publicity, as silly as that sounds. To let all see, there's no. We were trying to find out ways of letting the the youth know because the people that are going to go into the hole are going to be the young people. And we we tried with our music, and nobody would put out our music. And you know, we tried lots of different ways, and nothing worked. But now everyone's finding out. Like our music's finally coming out. And Charles will be able to speak for himself at, at the court and to show, um, I guess it just happened to let people know that, that this is the way it was happening. Because some people will believe. So then the way you think, perhaps this, this trial will be a, a good thing and maybe some kind of a, uh, a way to start the, uh, the revolution, is that right? It'll be one of the one of the movements towards starting it, yeah. Like it's already happening. In jail here there's a you can feel a lot of it. The tension, the Black Panthers and that type of thing, it's it's already starting. But by no means by no means will we ever prejudice or dislike the black, you know. It's not that way at all. 
The bad thing is we have love for them. And we're giving them their turn, which they deserve. Do you think the fact that all the publicity and uh, things about the Black Panthers has started just about the same time this trial is just a coincidence, or do you think that's ordained too? I don't think there's any coincidences. It's, it's just all come together. All these things, like I don't think that the Beatles, Blackbird, Fly, 